Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. June 11th is the International Day of Solidarity with Marius Mason and all long-term anarchist prisoners. This year, we want to explore the connections between long-term prisoner support and anti-repression efforts around recent around the recent uprisings, a sharp reminder to us that the difference between the status of imprisoned or not is a tenuous and temporary one. With thousands of arrests for protesting, rioting, and property destruction from last summer's George Floyd uprising, we must be preparing for the possibility that more of our friends and other rebels may end up in prison. We're also seeking to find ways to facilitate interactions between our long-term prisoners and uprisings in the street. To this end, we speak with Cameron and Vera, who are a part of the group that have supported the prisoners from the Ferguson Uprising for the last seven years, as well as Earthworm from Atlanta Solidarity and ATL Jail Support. And finally, Jeremy Hammond, formerly incarcerated anarchist and hacktivist, and his brother Jason Hammond, who works with the Chicago Community Bond Fund. They produce a podcast called Twin Trouble that's in the Channel Zero Network. These folks share with us experiences with state repression, what motivates them, and some thoughts on what we can be doing to make us, our communities, and our liberatory movements more resilient. These speakers respond to questions in the same order throughout the conversations, but didn't always identify themselves, so remember that the order of and the listing of projects can be found in our show notes. You can learn more about Marius Mason and how to support him at supportmariusmason.org. You can also see past podcasts by June 11th, prisoner statements, artwork, info about prisoners supported by the effort, a mixtape they curated last year, and events listed for various cities that you can join in on at June 11 or June11.org. We'll link the call out in English in our show notes, but it's also in Spanish, German, French, and Dutch on the website, alongside a ton of other material for printing, distribution, and sharing. We're releasing this audio before June 11th to entice folks to consider a potluck, or an action, or a letter-writing event, or a banner drop, a postering rampage, or something else to share that day with folks behind the walls. You can also hear our past interviews from June 11th, stretching back... Oh, about a decade uh, by looking at our website and just searching for that category or tag. If you're listening in Asheville, join Blue Ridge Anarchist Black Cross today, June 6th, for a letter writing event from 5 to 7 p.m. at West Asheville Park on Vermont Avenue. BRABC meets the first Sunday of every month at that time, provides info on prisoners with upcoming birthdays or who are facing repression, stationery, postage, and company. Have you never written a letter before? Don't know how to start? You can swing by and share some space. You can find out more about our project at brabc.blackblogs.org or follow us on social media. <laughs> Comrade David Easley, whose voice you've heard on the show a few times, who's currently held at Toledo Correctional Institution, has in previous months been viciously assaulted by prison staff at the direction of TOCI Warden Harold May. This has been experienced also by a number of other inmates who have been isolated for torture and for other purposes, covert and overt retaliatory actions at the facility. They've been denied adequate medical care for speaking out against the cruel, inhumane treatment at this Ohio facility. More and more comrades are reporting this occurring throughout the ODRC and across the country for any who dare stand up and speak for themselves and the voiceless within the steel and concrete walls. This is a call to action to zap the phone of U.S. District Court in Toledo, Ohio, and demand that Comrade David Easley be granted a phone conference with Judge James R. Nepp II and the Attorney General, because Comrade Easley's lawyer of record has decided to go rogue by not filing a memorandum contra motion as his client requested, and now the state has presented a motion to dismiss his case in court. There is more details in our show notes. If you feel like writing to David, uh, his address will be there as well. And for listeners who are interested, there is a fundraiser ongoing at the moment to cover lawyer fees as our good comrade sean swain attempts to argue to get his own release so he's got he's uh gotten the help of an outside lawyer and that costs money so give if you can check our show notes and also spread the word and we have one more final prisoner announcement this is about the health of giannis dimitrakis who's an anarchist bank robber 
unaffiliated with any other group um, who showed solidarity in the recent hunger strikes uh, across Greece. And with a N17 prisoner, Kufantinas. So this statement is from affiliates of the anarchist and autonomous radio station 1431 AM in Thessaloniki, Greece. We're hoping to be able to conduct an interview with Giannis um, once he's healed up and hopefully in time for the International Week of Solidarity with Anarchist Prisoners in August. Here's that statement. On May 24th, our comrade, a political prisoner, the anarchist Giannis Dimitrakis, was transported to the hospital of Lamia, seriously injured after the murderous attack he suffered at Domoku prison. Giannis barely survived the attack, and the blows he received caused multiple hematomas in the head, affecting basic functions of his brain. A necessary condition for the full recovery of this comrade is the complete and continuous monitoring of him in a specialized rehabilitation center by specialist doctors and therapists. In this crucial condition, the murderous bastards of the new democracy government, M. Criso Coides and Sofia Nicolaou, and their subordinates decided on Thursday, June 3rd, to transfer Giannis back to Demoko's prison and even to solitary confinement cell, supposedly for his health. Transferring our comrade there, with his brain functions in immediate danger, is for us a secondary attempt to kill him. Demoko's prison does not meet the slightest conditions for the treatment and recovery of a prisoner in such a serious condition. As a solidarity movement in general, we are again determined not to leave our comrades' armor in their blood-stained hands. Nothing should be left unanswered. None of the people in charge of the ever-intensifying death policy that they unleash should be left out of our sights. Immediate transfer of our partner to a specialized rehabilitation center, hands down from political prisoners. Solidarity and strength to anarchist fighter Giannis Dimitrakis. So this is an opportunity to put some of this June 11th solidarity into action. If you know any government holdings or any embassies, if you want to do a banner drop and send it to anarchist Black Cross folks back in Greece or to 1431 AM, these would be welcome actions. Show solidarity how you can. Learn about Giannis's case and uh, tell other people about him. These are some suggestions. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another project on CZN. Are you tired of listening to Western experts talking how the world works? Is another portion of liberal analysis of the uprising makes you fall asleep? Well, then check Elephant in the Room, an anarchist radio show from European Dresden, where we interview activists who are participating in struggles around the world. Elephant in the Room is a proud member of Channel Zero Network. You can find our show on your favorite podcast platforms, CZN website, or somewhere on the internet. From activists? For activists. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say, what you say, what you say, what? We're going like a war! There's a whole lot not going on right now. A whole lot more than you'd think. A few weeks ago, a Russian hacker group called Darkside hacked into a pipeline and shut it down. We saw the fallout from that. Gas prices went crazy. Cars lined up for miles. Wall Street panicked. Just one hack of one pipeline and the sky fell. The world ended. Dogs and cats engaged in interspecies fornication. Then, as the pipeline started back up and a bunch of bozos in suits started the series of press conferences to convince us that everything was okay, it leaked out that the energy company paid the ransom. Yeah, they paid the ransom. And then the hackers gave them back control of their pipeline. I don't know about you, but this was the first time I've heard of this kind of cyber piracy. I mean, there was that virus thing a while back that affected a British hospital system or something. Remember that? I suppose that might qualify on the same thing. Maybe. But my point is, this kind of thing doesn't get much coverage. You think these events are rare. The truth is, this past year, corporations have paid hundreds of millions in ransom to hackers. 
hundreds of millions. That means these kinds of hacks are happening all the time, everywhere. And the corporations are just keeping it quiet. They don't want investors to know, or else that might upset the market. And they don't want the rest of us to know, because then we'd all quit our jobs, learn programming, and not have to work for a living. We'd all just hack the corporations and collect ransom. I remember years ago reading a book called Endgame by Derek Jensen. This was before he became a homophobic turd and started denouncing the political orientation of the only people who bought Derek Jensen books, which would be kind of like me denouncing savage cannibal maniacs. Anyway, in Endgame, Jensen was contemplating how hackers could bring the existing global economic order to a halt. He described how every aspect of the production and distribution process for every single product and component in the world is cataloged and directed from place to place electronically. So, if you could simply hack into those databases, you could misdirect every product and component to go to the wrong places, causing the entire system to grind to a halt. Nothing could be made. Nothing could be sold. Even more catastrophic, hackers could just as easily introduce viruses into those systems and effectively melt them down entirely. It could be done by just a handful of hackers. Even then, in the early 2000s, guys like Jensen were pointing out how we greatly underestimate the vulnerabilities of our cyber systems. Today, those systems are probably less secure, relatively speaking, than the bank's train car on the steam trains robbed by the James Gang in the 1800s. If Frank and Jesse James were alive today, they'd be computer hackers. Bonnie and Clyde wouldn't be toting machine guns, they'd be toting laptops. But what Jensen pointed out back then was, nobody was hacking the system in order to melt it down because, frankly, there was no money in it. As simply a practical matter, people who have that set of skills usually don't acquire them in order to liberate the world from the system of global capital, from the systems of mass production and mass destruction. They acquire those skills so they don't have to work eight hours a day to buy cheese puffs and beer. But now there's a way to make money. In fact, there's a way to make hundreds of millions of dollars. The cartons of cigarettes at the grocery store are harder to steal than cyber ransom from major corporations. And so, now, I suspect, the Internet has become that slow-moving bank train that the James Gang intends to rob again and again. And just a side note here, but if banks didn't want their trains robbed, they wouldn't concentrate that much money into the train cars. So, now we get to the discussion of who is really behind these cyber train robberies, From what I read, the biggest hackers are a kind of outsourced subcontractor from the Russian government, a group that is ostensibly independent from the state, but operating in full knowledge of state authorities. This kind of relationship was invented by the United States when it funded proxy wars in Afghanistan and in Nicaragua, creating a new standard as to what was okay on the international scene. Now outsourcing the plausible, deniable private operatives is the norm. Hey, America. Now, I don't have a problem with the Russian state running hackers who collect ransom from billionaires. I don't care who's behind it. But if the Russian state is behind it, we can count on these activities not taking down the global system of capital because Russia benefits from the existence of the global system. Russia doesn't want to topple it. Russia just wants to improve their place in its pecking order. So, what I'm saying is, we can't count on the Russian state and its proxies to crash the global system. It won't go that far. It's going to take real non-state actors to replicate what the Russians are doing if we want to truly rob the train. It's going to take folks who are not beneficiaries of the existing order. Then, it gets really exciting. Until then, I think I'm cheering for the Russian team. They might not be Robin Hood, but they're a lot closer than the corporate executives with oil pipelines. 
This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain, an exile from Ohio at Buckingham Correctional in Dillon, Virginia. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain by addressing letters to Sean Swain, number 201-5638, Buckingham Correctional Center, P.O. Box 630, Dillwyn, Virginia, 23936. You can find his past writings, recordings of his audio segments, and updates on his case at seanswain.org, or now follow him on Twitter at, at Swain Rocks. Would you please introduce yourselves, maybe uh, who you are, what projects you're working on, and what experience you have with anti-repression prisoner support work? June 11. My name is Cameron. I live in St. Louis. I've been doing prisoner support stuff for like to like varying degrees for the last 10 or so years. Having, you know, letter writing nights, fundraising for commissary stuff, sending in newsletters to jails and prisons. And- I'm Vera. <laughs> this is the biggest uh, anti-repression uh, prisoner support project that I'm a part of or the longest running one. But similar to Cameron, I've been doing some support work uh, for prisoners for probably the last yeah, nine or ten years and have just maintained pen pals with several different prisoners across the states. And currently in southern Ontario, there are uh, prisons like across the region that are on hunger strike for different reasons, just especially in regards to the pandemic and how they've been treated. And so I've been doing plugging into some of the hunger strike support work here. But yeah, also still getting acquainted with how projects are done here in this new place that I live. Okay, my name's Earthworm from Atlanta, and I work with the Atlanta Solidarity Fund and the protester jail support team uh, in Cop Watch in East Atlanta. And we've got a lot of protester support experience because our friends have been getting arrested for years at different protests. So we uh, turned it into something that has scaled way, way up, of course, particularly in the last year with the George Floyd uprising. Well, you know me, I'm, my name is Jeremy Hammond. Uh, I was uh, recently released from federal prison several months ago. And, uh, you know, I've been involved for most of my adult life. And since my release, I've just kind of been slowly getting my feet wet and seeing what my involvement would be most appropriate. And I'm also here with my brother, uh, Jason Hammond. That's my voice right here. I'm his brother. And, um, yeah, I'm a longtime supporter of Jeremy, but uh, I'm also, of course, involved in on-the-ground protest-type related movements. Uh, one group that I'm a, a volunteer for is the Chicago Community Bond Fund. It's a bond fund that I've uh, been involved in prison abolition struggles, uh, no, most notably the George Floyd Black Lives Matter uprise last year. We did a lot of work for political prisoners during these uprisings, too. Can you tell us more about the role of your projects in uprising anti-repression and some of the prisoners you're supporting? Or talk about examples of political coordination and action with other prisoners that might give the audience a sense of the agency of folks behind bars? Well, I mean, in 2014, a group of us started uh, supporting folks who got locked up during the Ferguson uprising. And it kind of came out of desire to not ignore, but actually just like, actively promote the reality that the folks that were participating were engaged in like risky and creative and destructive actions like looting or shooting guns and arson and we kept seeing a lot of people fall through the cracks in 2014 like in terms of like getting support from like the quote-unquote movement and so we just really wanted to like make sure that folks got some kind of support And so a lot of the people that were participating weren't really like a part of a movement per se, like they weren't like in an activist organization or they weren't organizers. They were kind of articulating themselves outside of that. And so we just felt like that was really important to see and acknowledge because, yeah, there were people like have gone away for are now in prison for, you know, like five plus years, some people because of what they did. And like there's all sorts of cons- sort of narratives by the by nonprofits and activists that the people who are like doing the heavier stuff were hurting the movement or kind of a part of a conspiracy of outsiders or criminals. And 
it felt like that kind of narrative it was just reproducing the same that caused this moment, this uprising, this sort of like demonization of people, like this sort of keeping people in their place, ignoring the fact that people have agency and ability to like refuse to be victimized by systems that want to kill them or hurt them. And I personally just feel like I was very frustrated to not see that narrative promoted or like accepted. That was kind of the big reason why I got involved in supporting folks to go back to like nonprofit stuff. Like a lot of those folks weren't really seeing like what was happening right in front of them. This was an uprising that was extremely combative against not just the police, but also private property and the, the authority of a lot of people who want to keep things the way they are. And people from all walks of life were, you know, just coming to this situation and like getting wrapped up in it and like getting arrested and like doing things that were dangerous and not really talked about in like a legible, easily palatable story. Yeah, it was just a very hard thing to watch. And having gone through my own like legal like issues through going through courts for years and being arrested a bunch of times and just like knowing how like that is to experience and how like grueling it is to like go from one continuance to another and just like not and like I knew I had people who had my back and people who would come to my court dates and I just wanted to like return that as well to other people. Yeah, I can maybe just talk a little bit more about the specifics of the project that Cameron and I are a part of as far as like the prisoners that we are supporting. They are just from a a, a compilation or like a list that we compiled from just mailing letters to people who got arrested during the Ferguson uprising, people from all walks of life and in that neighborhood and not necessarily people that we could say that we were like politically aligned with because it might even be safe to say that all of the people that we are supporting when we started supporting them wouldn't necessarily have aligned themselves with any sort of politics. Uh, Yeah, we sent letters and just said basically if they were willing to, we would put them on this public list, which is the list on anti-state, put their images out there and their, their mailing addresses and their, and and thereby making it easier for people across the country to, to support them. And so that list we've maintained or someone has maintained over the years. Um, And we had, I think, 11 people at one point. And now it's down to, oh, gosh, like five or six, maybe, because people have gotten out just uh, specifically from that from that list of folks. There's two people that that I spend a lot of time in communication with and with them and their families and have visited and everything. Um, And one of them actually, Cameron was alluding to this, but, you know, people would get arrested in Ferguson for doing a lot of what a lot of people were doing, which was, you know, looting and destruction of property and everything. And and one of the guys that I support was uh, arrested for those things. And then because of priors, whenever he was sentenced, he actually got a sentence of 60 years. So he's going to be in for the rest of his life. So that's like a very long term in some ways that to me is like very mind blowing. And it's a very good example of the people that were acting in the streets weren't always people that we were familiar with their lifestyle or familiar with, with their, the risks that they were, that they were taking. So we ran jail support for anybody that was arrested. um, And we're doing prisoner support for anybody who is stuck in jail because denied bail or because they're, you know, unfortunately sent prison. So we've uh, provided all sorts of support for arrested folks. All right. Well, certainly um, my, my experience in prison, you have a, a wide variety of individuals who are locked up, many of which have become politicized in prison. And so they see someone who's uh, locked up on a case like such as mine with uh, support from uh, political movements on the outside. You know, people know that I'm an anarchist and a prison abolitionist, right? And a lot of people are very curious about this Right. And uh, because of all the experiences in their own lives, having been repressed by the criminal justice system. As far as examples of coordination, you know, there's unfortunately like prison, they want to put bury you. Right. They want to prevent you from communicating to the outside world to receive information of what's going on in the outside world. And so 
the work that's being done on the outside, such as, you know, everything from books to prisoners to support at people's uh, court dates and stuff to having, you know, noise demonstrations inside the jail really gets people who are, uh, you know, curious about what's going on. Like, and so, you know, for example, like I, I would re- regularly receive zines and newsletters from ABC and other organizations, right, which are very uh, useful in discussing things that we would otherwise only have access to, like, say, for example, something on the news, like, we would only receive information about what's going on with like the uh, like George Floyd uprising, the Michael Brown uprising, based on what was in the news, right? But now we have additional materials to share and discuss uh, as a focus of uh, discussions, for example, newsletters from actual movement stuff itself. And so when people see like the jail demonstrations outside the jail, when people see that there's, you know, people attending each one of your courtrooms, that they know that there is kind of a, a camaraderie, a, a sense of loyalty and commitment to something it kind of brings like prisoners together that you know we're not just alone that we're there's a continuum of resistance and each of our stories plays a part in that so um this is jason speaking right now i could talk about my experiences with uh chicago community bond fund just a little back history this is a bond fund that was uh, organized in response uh to the uprisings in chicago against the Chicago police scandal, the murder of Laquan McDonald. There were a large movement, which included a number of arrests, to protest the, the cover-up and of the murder. And so we, uh, people had raised a good amount of money to, to bind out the, the resistors, the protesters. And in, in, in the wake of that, it basically coalesced into a movement of an organization that tried to address, you know, the, uh, the problems of the, the prison system, the uh, Cook County Jail, the mass incarceration project. Uh, it was an abolitionist project, so we started just working with the community um, and bonding out people's family, loved ones, friends, and all that, as basically as much as we could to try to empty the jail out. This was, I think, around like 2016. Fa- uh, fast forward to the, the George Floyd uprising. Uh, the organization had been long a supporter of the of the BLM movement, and when this had happened, the organization had definitely uh, stepped up to you know do everything they possibly could within their organization to not just bond out, you know, the protesters and uh, the activists, but of course uh, the larger community that was involved in, let, let's say, property distribution, looting, breaking property destruction. They cited uh, clearly on that stance, which, in fact, BLM Chicago um, as well had made a stance to support people involved in the looting. So we every day we'd be out uh, bonding people from Cook County Jail. Sometimes I personally would be with a list of like 10 people in the jail, just binding as many people as we possibly could, as well as trying to amplify and elevate the struggles of other organizations working to change the system. Yeah, that's just one thing the Chicago Community Bond Fund had been, you know, doing in 2020. And, and we're still yeah, doing it. Yeah. And we're still doing it, you know. We also was a, a campaign to change the, you know, basically an end money bail type law in, in uh, Illinois. It's, uh, it's, it's said it's an end money bail, but of course felonies and a little bit... Uh, Less palatable type charges like uh, violent charges or domestic charges are not available, but these are details in the bo- in the bond bill. But it's still a pretty good bill, the Pretrial Fairness Act that passed in Illinois because of our grassroots shit. However, there are still plenty of other challenges beyond the fact about money. For example, where or, or the campaign was end money bail, right? However, how, there's all kinds of other like compounding details that would allow a person to get what they call a no bond. For example, if they have two charges, they could be bonded out for the first one, but for the second one. In light of the fact that they were already on bond, they could have just give them what they call a no bond so that they're still in there no matter how expensive their bond is or depending on what kind of charge it is. So for, for that reason, there's still tons of people currently in Cook County Jail. And, you know, we, we are expecting the numbers to go down as the, the law rolls out, it's expecting to kind of like be fully Im- implemented in two years. But we are we are going to still see a number of people still in the Cook County Jail system, even though they are pre-trial, um, just because of all kinds of other laws that would prevent someone from leaving, you know. A, lot, a large part of this country do not want to see the changes that we are fighting for be implemented. And, uh, you know, I mean, all you have to do is just kind of look at their rhetoric and and uh, what their actions are. They're, they're pushing back in, in the legal sense as well. And, uh, yeah, there, there's there's a major political battle basically between the far right, the the John Cotton Zara, FOP, CPD camp, as well as the the, uh, the state's attorney Kim Fox, Lori Lightfoot, uh, Kim Fox has been actually pretty vocal in support of the end money bail project, the law. So, like, there's there's a there's a political battle, of course, as well. 
have you seen your support work change over time, for instance, you know, the progression from in like supporting someone through their initial arrest and bonding out to serving a prison sentence or doing other like follow up work with them, if that's not the case, or if you were in prison, how did your needs change over time from the initial like court support and uh, folks showing up and, and fundraising for lawyers uh, during the initial phase to like maybe follow up? Well, I mean, initially we, you know, found all these people's names from like media articles, like there's a website in Missouri where you can just like find all the court records of cases. And so we just kind of like comb through all those and sent letters to them and stuff. And as folks started getting sentenced, some were incarcerated in prisons, other time, other people were like given time served because they'd been in jail the whole time and weren't bailed out. So then the focus shifted from doing like court support to like just letter writing and some amount of fundraising when we could. So like just trying to fundraise for putting money on their books or like, you know, maybe some of us have steady work or whatever. So we, you know, give $10, $20 a month to one person each. At this point, if that's where it's at for the folks, at least for me, where for the folks that are still locked up and a few folks have been released in the last couple of years, we kind of always try to check in with them when they're about to get the re- get released. Like if they need anything, like here's what we can offer. Like we we're a pretty it's a pretty small group we don't we're not like a actual like organization or like we just like kind of run on our own capacity but we try to you know help people when they get released a little bit and i've maintained communication with at least one person pretty steadily who's been released and we're you know we're actually you know we're, we're friends and uh but yeah, basically, it's like kind of, it's been so long. I mean, 2014 is so long ago. And people who, a lot of these people, like, maybe, you know, they, they were in prison and they got out. And there, there was never like an effort to convert somebody to like some political sway or like political ideology. It was always just sort of like, like you, you were, you were a participant and we would want the same if we were locked up. So because of that, like a lot of times there's still a connection, but also people like have their own lives and they've can, they like move on or they like have their struggles. And I don't know. It's, I guess I bring that up because yeah, just to like sort of talk about like the capacity that we have as individuals trying to do this and how we're not a charity. We're not a nonprofit or like social workers. So we're kind of trying to meet people where they're at and like, have like a more down to earth relationship. And if it leads, if it leads to more of a friendship, then great. If it doesn't, that's not the point of it or whatever. I would, I would echo a lot of that. Honestly, like the progression, I guess, of, of what our support work looked like at times, I would even say was like a bit awkward and clunky, like without this baseline of, you know, we are anarchists or we are radicals and therefore we acted during this uprising. I think it was a bit unclear for both the folks that were locked up and their support networks as to who we were. You know, we were not social workers. We're not like an a activist organization with a bunch of money coming in. You know, uh, we have a, a little website on no blogs and we're kind of you know as far as this group is made up of now i think there's like two people left in st louis who are who are still there and still active in it and the rest of us are are all over so it's rather like a a disjointed and and kind of a a funny awkward conversation to have at times you know where i'm i'm talking to one of the guys that i i support his name is alex and had I had to have like several conversations with Alex's mom to kind of like get her to understand who I was and that I wasn't like someone who was going to help place her son in a job once he got out I was just someone who was going to make sure that her son was looked after and not forgotten about and you know if if something needed to happen where you know he needed 
his caseworker to be bothered about some piece of mail or if he wasn't getting shoes or something, then I was the person that was going to call and do that. And those sorts of things. I think that we had to be willing to kind of have those awkward conversations with people. And I think that, you know, for the most part, that's been, that's been fine. You know, we've at the, at worst it's awkward, you know, but we are, we have been able to raise money and get, people when they get released we've been able to give them phones and you know clothing and help them feel cared for in small ways and I think that that's that's a really important piece of what we do. Earthworm can you tell us about Atlanta? I guess when we started doing jail support work it was more on the fly in response to arrests happening. It was just kind of catch as catch can you know Somebody would be in jail and they'd need $4,000 to go to a bail bondsman to cover their $40,000 bail. And we would need to come up with it just by calling all our friends and, um, you know, scrambling to put somebody's rent money up and hope that somebody could pay them back by the time rent's due. And we realized in doing that that we needed a more organized uh, and we needed a bail fund. So in 2016, we started collecting money for that. And, you know, sometimes when people get arrested, it makes a lot of news and a bunch of uh, donations roll in. And sometimes you're able to even set some aside and have that for the next set of arrests. And, of course, sometimes it's more expensive than the amount you bring in. So we sort of struggled along through a whole series of different protests. And then in the George Floyd uprising, we were fortunate enough that we already were established and we had this, we had a website and we had you know, this long history of being able to bail out protesters. So we were sort of already a trusted group and we were able to be really central in that effort and got way more donations than we were used to, but of course also way more arrests than we were used to. But with the donations, we were able to cover a lot more of the protesters needs. So, you know, whereas before, the money had just been very strictly for bail and hiring lawyers. You know, we've been able to do things like pay everybody's fines and fees and pay for medical costs and pay for, you know, other incidental things, like a babysitter if you need to go to court. Other things we, uh, you know, would never have been able to afford before. And the other thing that is a very blessed change is we no longer have a cap to the amount of bail that we're able to post because before we had enough money, we didn't want to blow it all on one protester. So if you were in there on, you know, $40,000 bail or bond, we could only cover a portion of that, and then we would have to scramble to fundraise the rest of it. So in the early stages, even before arrests happen, when we hear about a protest that's getting set up, so that arrests might happen, we get the jail support team together and start scheduling, you know, who's going to be available for the, you know, 36 hours after the protest if arrests go down. So we've got our phone people who have, there's a physical cell phone because that's all you can call from jail. And they take turns carrying that and they'll, you know, one phone person will bring it to the next person when their turn is over. We schedule people to do arrestee tracking, which is finding out who's been arrested, finding them in the jail system and keeping track of them to figure out when they are able to be bailed out and then getting them bailed out and getting people to meet them there at the jail when they're out. Um, And then once they're out, uh, that is when court support takes over. And that's everything from keeping track of when their court dates are and sending them reminders to, you know, finding them lawyers and helping, you know, getting people there to their court dates and whatever sort of support they need while their court case is going on. And then once their court case is over, there's follow-up, you know, hopefully they don't go to prison or anything, but there may be support to do as far as helping them if there's going to be a civil lawsuit, helping them find lawyers for that or helping them with whatever kind of evidence gathering or whatever support they need with that. Of course, they may have fines and fees to pay or like ankle monitor fees and that's all stuff that fortunately now we're able to afford or Unfortunately, sometimes people go to prison and then it's time for prisoner support, which we do also to the people who are denied bail and they're sitting in jail waiting for their trial to happen, of which we've got about eight in Atlanta. So that means writing them letters and 
uh, they also have the phone number. So the same phone people who are doing the like intake calls the night that people get arrested are also um, hearing from the long-term prisoners and just figuring out what support they need. Ideally, everybody who's sitting in jail has their whole support crew of friends and family and whatever supporters. And those support crews can coordinate with each other and with the Solidarity Fund to make sure everybody's getting what they need. Failing that, the jail support team just needs to act as the support crew for each prisoner, meaning that the only number they're calling is the jail support phone and the jail support phone people are communicating with the prisoner support people at large who aren't like the prisoner support for a particular individual um, and just saying, you know, so-and-so wants this kind of book. Can anybody volunteer to send them that? Or, you know, so-and-so is not receiving medical attention and we need to get everybody we know to call the jail and pressure them to let him see a doctor and, and so on like that. Oh my gosh, it sounds like y'all really got that figured out. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think it's a process of figuring it out on an ongoing basis. I um, appreciate you saying that, but I definitely don't think anybody feels like we have it figured out. <laughs> this is Jeremy. So certainly the uh, arrest and pretrial support work is very crucial. It's very different than, say, post-conviction, post-sentencing. First, I think we just need to listen to the uh, particular circumstances and needs of uh, each person and their charge, but also recognize that since we're talking about groups and waves of repression, uh, all the uh, circumstances are also linked. In particular, uh, uh, somebody who's facing charges often can't openly talk in detail about like what they're particularly being charged with. So I think it kind of does rely on support communities to kind of, it's, it's a political battle because they want to like build support for the individual, but also like build support for the particular so-called crimes that they've been accused of if it's like a, a direct action that they're currently in prison for. So the way uh, the public narrative goes the way of in support of what the prosecution's characterization of the crimes are, right? Like if, say, uh, some of the uh, actions over the past couple of years and the uprisings involve various arsons and property destruction, like, well, I think it's important these groups uh, doing support work not just support the individual and whatever the particular like legal strategy is, like say they're innocent or whatever, but also support the actual crimes themselves. We have to legitimize the act itself uh, to the public. And then, of course, uh, post-conviction, you know, hopefully, uh, the, I think it makes a difference, the, uh, the amount of time in the, in the whole negotiation process, the charges like the prosecutors are willing to uh, offer up. It does make a difference if they believe that the person being prosecuted is uh, in isolation versus if they're part of like uh, a movement and uh, the prosecutor strategy is also different and they might be more willing to make like better deals or make concessions that would be a better outcome for the individual and then of course post conviction you know post sentencing you want to give a voice to someone who's now freely able to speak and then of course the other thing is as the person's time draws to a conclusion and they're about to be released the needs also change you want to make sure that somebody has every opportunity to, to make it upon their release, especially like long-term prisoners, like their ease of adapting. Uh, and, and fortunately, I can say that like they, they've taken care of me throughout my entire bid, and I have nothing but respect and admiration for the various groups that came on and supported me. And because of that, I had a pretty easy transition when I was released. You know, people came and picked me up from the jail. People were bringing me stuff at the halfway house. Uh, you know, my brother and friends made sure that I had a place to stay. You know, so these type of things, like, help uh, ease the uh, transition, you know what I mean? Because otherwise, the state would just kick you out and basically hope that you fail again. And so it's up to us to make sure that that, that doesn't happen. Yeah, and that, but on that point, it especially when a person's been inside for decades, like, a decade is a long fucking time. But if someone's been in for 30 years, like, the, like the amount of change that's occurred during that period of time, the amount of, like, the amount of, like, loss of loved ones, like... It's, yeah, yeah, it's truly shocking, um, uh, especially like the cultural changes, the changes in their city. Um, you know, people might not. Everything is technology. People definitely have difficulty adapting to how how people apply for jobs and people secure housing and stuff like that is all different now. So there have been thousands of people arrested during the George Floyd uprising last year. Over 300 federal cases and innumerable state felony cases. So, given your experience, 
what can we be doing now to prevent and prepare um, for those uprising defendants, some of them serving time in prison? Cameron and Vera? To me, it, it feels kind of inevitable. Part of it feels hard to prevent people from acting or not that you're, this is not, that's not the question, but like, like prevent, like repression is, it feels hard because uprisings are often just sort of like, they're super spontaneous and people like who don't necessarily consider like surveillance or security culture, like maybe some of us do or like anarchists or radicals do like are going to get, get caught up in like the repression. And I guess, yeah, I guess ideally it would be a matter of trying to like really push for people to like be aware of if like a surveillance camera can see you or be aware of like the risk that you're taking, but also like in some ways having that kind of sort of awareness can actually kind of placate you. So it's sort of a hard, hard balance to figure out how to like kind of prevent avoidable like repression because yeah, people are going to do what they're going to do. And like, I think at least having that baseline of that's what's going to happen is like where I start from. I think it's very hard to know how to talk about what prevention looks like. We have our experience and, and especially um, having gone through Ferguson and, and especially like the repression support work post Ferguson, we can look at that and say, okay, we know how bad this can get. So, you know, let's keep this from happening. But then, you know, how do you do that? Like, how do you like make those connections in, in, in the moment? I, I can remember a moment last summer during one of the uh, demos, the George Floyd demos that happened. And I was so, I was hyper aware of everyone that didn't have their faces covered. And so I'm running around, you know, and I'm a white woman who's, you know, in my 30s, running around telling people to cover their faces. And they feel invincible in the moment. You know, they feel like nothing's going to stop me. Like nothing, no one's stopping me right now. Like, what do I care? And here I am running around telling them all like, <laughs> to cover their faces and they're looking at me like no get away from me this isn't your moment you know and and in, in like some ways it's like yeah that's true and like what am I gonna do am I gonna stop you and say look I know how this goes you know I know how this ends and start telling them you know and the answer is no I'm not gonna do that but I think that that is part of what we can do you know like show up to these things with just bandanas to hand out you know and as far as preparation I, I don't know I thought about that but I think that the model of what this of what this support group is doing find a small group of people and we're we are we're a small group of people that are just willing to say okay these 11 people we're going to make sure they're taken care of and um, I think if you can if you can form groups like that and just kind of trust each other to do the bottom line for some of these some of these people that are getting locked up i think that that can be a a really good start number one thing i think we need to be educating everybody that we can about not talking to police and doing other security culture measures to keep ourselves from going to jail in the first place you know as far as educating people about wearing masks and security cameras and just taking precautions about things that could get somebody in trouble, not talking about illegal things that somebody could get in trouble for, not posting sketchy stuff on social media, not talking to the cops or anybody who might talk to the cops. And when I say not talking to the cops, like not saying anything to the cops other than I'm going to remain silent, I want to see a lawyer, or am I being detained, am I free to go, or I don't consent to a search. And that is it as far as what anybody should say to the police. So... I think holding trainings and holding them for as many people as we can, uh, particularly because we're getting lots of brand new people who aren't used to being protesters, is going to save us so many countless hours and misery in terms of people going to jail and potentially prison later on. Because it's so heartbreaking when you hear about somebody didn't know 
that they shouldn't talk to the cops or they didn't know that they had the right to not talk to cops and they just, you know, threw away what, what power they had to protect themselves. In their or I guess you could say, conversely, when we hear about people who did get that training and did know to keep their mouth shut and were able to tell their friends to keep their mouth shut, that prevents them from going to jail and that is a huge relief. You know, when we when we hear from people and they're like, oh, no, I didn't say anything to the cops. You think I'm crazy? That's just like a choir of angels singing. <laughs> so first off, as was everything, it's important that you think through your actions before you carry them out. And I think it's also important to look at kind of the history of cases and to see, like, how people got caught and the mistakes people have made so that way we don't repeat the same mistakes, so that way we don't keep, like, this ongoing cycle of uh, arrests and incarceration. We, we obviously want to reduce the numbers of people captured by the state. This is Jason now. Yeah, so obviously don't get caught is the ongoing lessons that we're trying to learn. Secondly, we can't, we can't forget we have to keep the momentum up for people who are facing charges. We have to demand their charges be dropped in whatever form we can. You know, we could be writing letters, we could be doing petitions, we could be doing protests, we could be doing rallies, we could be doing letter writing parties, we could, you know, organize our own letter writing chapters, we could write organize our own prisoner support chapters. So there's there's all kinds of things that we could be doing and are doing to kind of keep the momentum up. This is this is a pretty unique moment where you're still in the wake of one of the largest uprisings of many people's lives. And uh, there is a lot of energy ready to be harvested to kind of push push uh, the abolition, you know, our our work forward as well as uh, you know change the system. So you know, the people who are arrested, you know, trying to, you know, fight the power, change the system, they really are, they really need to be supported if we, we agree with their goals. So let's, uh, let's just do everything we can to keep the momentum going. Um, and, you know, people are exploring new ways of doing this. So one of the big things with long-term prisoner support that June 11th is trying to address is not letting these people be forgotten. As interest and attention from last summer is already greatly decreased. What can we do to ensure energy and support lasts as long as the effects of the repression will? For me, like it's important to be like unapologetic about what people do or for people to be, yes, people engaged in collective and individual actions that were incredibly threatening to the state and capital, and then they get caught. So it's like, it is being unapologetic about it is sort of giving people a sense of agency in their actions as opposed to kind of seeing folks as they became, I mean, obviously people became victims of state repression, but like they were resisting being repressed in day-to-day life or oppressed in day-to-day life. And I guess just like putting it that way is help can help me kind of see the reality of it and for lack of a better word, like humanize people. For instance, I think last summer people were actually like coming out in support of looting. Like that wasn't happening in 2014. That was like a very hard position to hold. And I think it still is in a lot of circles today, but it was very exciting to me because um, it helps sort of people see the people that are doing that and create this sort of contagious effect of like, oh, like people who are doing that are doing that for a variety of reasons and they deserve to be supported if they get arrested. That deserves to be spread and not just thrown under the rug. Because I think if you do that, then you lose the essence, throwing the fact that there's looting, the throwing the fact that there's lots of burning going on, the fact that there's a fair amount of combative gunfire in the air, just all sorts of creative stuff going on sort of gives a lot of dimension to these uprisings. And I think people can see themselves better in that than they can see themselves in like a more civil disobedience sort of narrative that often just completely erases that. Just talking about it in that way and just like, again, just being unapologetic, like we want to build a a different world or live in a different world. And like the way we get to that is dangerous, but also can be very empowering and exciting and like incredibly worthwhile. And the more people who like are unapologetic about it, who are like, I support all these combative 
actions, the more to me it's on people's minds and the less likely it can be swept under the rug. Yeah, I think that's that's the the move that we see or like this this boundary pushing, I guess, of, of an acceptable narrative. I think that we can we can participate in that as as anarchists and as as actors in these rebel and rebellious moments. I don't always know how to like push those narratives of of the boundary shifting. You know, I I don't know social media is, has never been my strong suit, but I think that there are ways to take it to social media and and push those things. You know, as as the nonviolent protesters and you know, the police were the big bad and we weren't doing anything wrong sort of thing. Uh, that's when we saw some of the people that we supported sort of get forgotten, you know. And I think that that's changed. I think that that was different last summer um, and, and that the repression support is going to look different because of that. I think that's great. I think that there's still more work to do and I think that we can be a part of that work. Again, I don't always know how. I think having those conversations, like j- just from a personal example, I know that everyone in my family was very confused about my participation in, in Ferguson stuff. Last summer, half of my family was in the streets after dark. Um, and I think in part because of the conversations that we were having and the ways that things started to be more acceptable and more people were willing to confront this discomfort. Well, that is a tough one. I think that's something that long-term prisoners experience widely. You know, you get a lot of support in the first couple of years and then once you're in there for a few years, the world keeps going and kind of starts to pass you by, you know, and it's just heartbreaking to think about people in there wondering if anybody still cares about them and, you know, getting those those letters that are just such a precious lifeline when you're in there and getting them less and less often. That's got to be a desperate feeling. I think anybody who hasn't experienced that, we probably don't understand just how much of a lifeline that support from the outside is. So I think trying to communicate that to people and talk about prisoner support as a core anti-repression effort, I think it often gets overlooked as sort of one of the unsexy grunt work things. And it's, you know, it's kind of hard to write letters. I think there's some like social anxiety there. People don't know what to say. But just getting that to be more of a core part of all of our efforts. It's a mutual aid effort because you and I one day are very likely to end up doing some time, you know, if we're effective at what we're trying to do, you know, and I hope we are, that's extremely likely that they're going to come after us. So setting up these efforts and promoting them as this is an important part of the anti-repression work that we do, supporting prisoners, you know, could directly benefit us one day and will definitely benefit our community. So, and I think that there are a lot more opportunities to do prisoner support, but it's kind of overlooked as an activity because I frequently run into people who say, you know, I don't have a lot of consistent time, but I'm able to do something, you know, here and there. What kind of work do you recommend? And I'm like, write a prisoner. You can do that on your own. You can do it kind of at work or whenever you get a few minutes. It's totally independent and it is such a lifeline for that person and it's a way to directly help you know because there's so much that we do that is kind of planting seeds for the future or just hoping that one day it'll bring about revolutionary change which this I think again is a big important piece of doing the prisoner support but it also directly means so much to a specific individual that you can see the difference that it makes so talking to people who need guidance about how they can contribute and who maybe want to work independently, maybe can't leave the house, don't have good transportation, you know, aren't able to come to meetings. This is something that you can do from home that you can do entirely by yourself. If if you're not able to risk arrest or if you're not able to physically keep up with a march, you can keep in touch with a prisoner. You can write them. If you hate writing letters, you can get a JPay account and send emails. That's a lot easier. You can put money on your phone account and let them call you, or you can, uh, some jails and prisons have the, like, video visit thing you can do. Any of that, once again, I don't think we can even really understand how important it is for them to know that there's somebody out there that they can count on, that they can, you know, reach out to if they're in a desperate situation. 
I think another like big barrier to people's willingness to begin writing a prisoner is uncertainty about how much time they can commit to it and, you know, not wanting to start off strong and then kind of leave the prisoner hanging, which is an important concern. But I would say, you know, if you can only do one letter every six months, be upfront about that. But if you can only do one letter as a one-time thing, just be truthful about that and set the expectations realistic. And whatever you can do is incredibly meaningful. And for you, Jeremy? Well, certainly the, the work that people have done with June 11th have brought attention to, like, anarchist and uh, earth liberation prisoners who have experienced long amounts of time behind bars and they have not been forgotten uh, and their stories aren't over either. Uh, as far as like the cycle of repression and arrest and incarceration, uh, how do we avoid uh, burnout and how do we ensure energy and stuff like that? I think one of the big things is we need to realize that we have the capability of winning, that this isn't just like an ongoing cycle that's going to repeat forever. Like we believe that we will win. We believe that there is going to be a moment that we could overturn the system. Abolition is mainstream discourse now, you know, so we just need to keep the pressure up and keep it going and keep chipping away at the armor of the system. Of course, avoid arrests, you know, I mean, as much as possible and, and bring attention to the, the people who have unfortunately fell into the dragnet. But I think one of the other things that I liked about uh, the work that people have done around June 11th is that it kept people who are behind bars involved to the extent possible. And uh, really, like, as someone who's been behind bars and who have been following the June 11 stuff, like, we want to see people continue the work that we've been doing. Like, even though we, we might not have all the details, we don't need to know all the details. Yeah, so, I mean, there were thousands of arrests last year. It's summertime now. They say that somewhat the interest has waned in uh, protest scene. People want to go back to normal or whatever. But I, I don't see it that way. I see plenty of people still willing to fucking take the fight. And so let's let's get creative. Let's see what new kind of things we could do. Let's let's keep the struggle up. Keep amplifying. Like 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 my brother had said, we do believe we could win, and we do believe that we have made a lot of lot of changes. You know, just within the last year. You know, let's see how far we could take it. What could it look like to have more connection between long term political or politicized prisoners and activity and resistance in the streets and elsewhere? Part of my impetus for being involved in the Ferguson prisoner support group or whatever is was just kind of in trying to encourage a culture of like solidarity, especially in a way that tries to cross all sorts of cultural and subcultural divides, whether that be like racial or gender or whatever class, whatever, just like trying to see how we can fortunately and unfortunately have this moment where especially during an uprising, we're not like following a, an easy script because day to day life is extremely segregated. It's extremely it can feel pretty isolating, like going through day to day life, going to work, going to school, raising your family, whatever, and being just in that baseline. And then whenever that kind of gets shook up a little bit, it's, it's an opportunity if you like have a certain perspective to try to bridge or break break out of that sort of stalemate. I think with the prisoner support stuff, it's always felt important to me to try to meet people where they're at, to have a variety of folks from all sorts of disparate or common situations and just have more perspective. And I love trying to foster situations or moments or being, being in moments where that is a little more uninhibited or more relaxed so like how do you do that outside of these ideal and they're not even really ideal there's all sorts of terrible things that happen in uprisings as well but i don't want to romanticize that as if i can but it is a thing where yeah it feels a little looser and easier so like how do you do that when it's over how do you like foster a culture of, of solidarity of mutual aid that continues to break down like separations i think we're always between a rock and a hard place with this but like i think and especially in this case like writing folks after the uprising ends ideally it can help create like a sense that oh like if this happens like maybe somebody who's in prison like it's like this happens to a friend maybe i would do the same thing maybe they would have always done the same thing because Obviously, people have their own like support networks, but like maybe us doing that kind of helps spark an idea that like, oh, like if somebody's in trouble or if somebody's having a hard time, 
because of like state repression or because of work or all sorts of struggles, I can do something too. Or I can call these people who helped me in the past and we can do something about it. So like, that's the ideal that I have of doing this project. I mean, on an, also on a practical level, like having more support inside and outside of prison walls and jails is helpful. Like if one of us happens to go to prison or jail, we might know somebody in there, somebody you connected with who's like out is released, like might be like, oh yeah, I got a buddy in this jail or this prison that you're going to. And it might help you out kind of not like a, the most empowering thing, but it's like, again, it's like you're in between a rock and a hard place and these situations Ultimately, I want to like break out of having to think about that, but I think it's a great place to start. Yeah, I, it's I, I feel similar to Cameron that there's parts of this that just feel tough to answer, especially regarding like the, the prisoner support work that we're doing with people who I don't know that they would identify as as political prisoners. But maybe something that I have learned from this and from and from them is you know like i was i was kind of talking about the the awkwardness of making the connection at first and then sort of allowing that to just be what it was like you know i'm here and i know you because of this thing you know because we were acting at the same time in the same place for a lot of the same reasons and then sort of seeing where that takes us and because these guys are not political prisoners or you know quote unquote political prisoners it's it's taken me and our relationship in, in all sorts of places. And, and I think that that's been like a beautiful way to connect. It's, it's opened up like my eyes to a lot of a lot of the different just day to day oppression that that some of these people have been living through and that they're sort of like allowing me to to see into their life. You know, me as someone who they wouldn't have allowed that before all of this. And I think that that's been like a really beautiful piece that's come out of this because we sort of like open it up for connection to happen in all sorts of ways that don't really hinge on, you know, let's read this radical text together and and have a a book club about it, but it it looks different. And then suddenly, you know, George Floyd uprising happens and I'm getting emails and phone calls from them where they're just, you know, talking to me about how this is inspiring them from the inside and how they're talking to people other there are other inmates inside about like why they acted in the way that they did and and suddenly you see like this fire again and then you get to be inspired by that with them and and I think that like a lot of that is because we allowed for like a more open connection and then we're allowed to go down this path with them I think our connection with these guys is a bit different but it's still one that I continue to feel inspired by How about you Earthworm Again I think staying in touch with people is the very ground level of that writing to those folks and you know asking for their advice and their input Atlanta ABC runs a newsletter that we send out to probably about 250 prisoners um, mostly in Georgia but throughout the southeast that's mostly written by them because they'll receive the newsletter and we put a ask for contributions in it and then they'll mail us and we type it up and get it in the next newsletter and staying in touch that way, you know, at least they're connected in with what's going on. They're getting news about whatever the revolutionary struggles are, and they're able to give their input. They're able to lend support to people who are facing charges, who might go to prison, because they obviously have the clearest idea of how to handle that and how to keep that in perspective, you know, if you're facing a little bit of time. Being in touch with someone who's doing a lot of time can be very helpful. We also publish prisoners' writings on the Anarchist Black Cross website. And when they, you know, are engaging with something that's going on in the moment, we'll publish that more widely, you know, kind of spread that to other news sources to keep them engaged that way. I think the other part of that is to hear from them about what struggles are going on inside the prison and connect the people who are working on the outside to lend support to those things, you know, so if people are being brutalized in there or there's some horrible racist guard who's harassing particular inmates or behaving badly in general, we on the outside are able to bring pressure on that as a result of maintaining those connections with long-term prisoners. So there are eyes and ears on the side. Certainly, like, 
the world we're building is a world without prisons, and we want everybody to be freed unconditionally, regardless of their particular circumstances. We support m- political prisoners and prisoners of war, but we also support politicized prisoners. We also support prisoners of every, you know. So often, though, like with the state, will target like political cases as like canary in, in, in the coal mine type situations where they use new legal techniques to go after political prisoners that, if successful, they'll generalize. But the, the same works both ways too. What they'll they'll also use tactics to target segments of the population that they think nobody will rush to defend either for that matter. And so it's important that we're fighting for all different types of cases and not letting uh, the state get away with anything. As far as encountering each other, you know, I, we need to keep up like the sending physical newsletters uh, into the in the prisons, so sending books to people in prison, doing radio shows on radio networks that will have reached within prison. Uh, the jail demos and stuff like that. Like you would be very surprised the um, long-term reach that some of these actions happen. Like for example, uh, like when I was being transferred around a couple years ago with the grand jury of Virginia thing, right? I ran into somebody at the uh, tra- Oklahoma Transfer Center, right? And I thought he looked familiar, right? Then he came and said something to me. He's like, "I remember you and Jerry uh, were at New York. They uh, they were always having uh, demonstrations outside the jail for you all." And I was like, "Wow, that was like eight years ago." But you never know, like, something like that could stick in people's minds. And I, I think that has an effect on the mentality of uh, people that you are not alone. You're not, you're not fighting this alone. And that with June 11 specifically, like, if you are questioning whether you want to be involved in something, like, first off, you should always think your actions through. But know that if you do get in trouble, the movement will have your back. That will we'll see you through this whole thing that you're not alone. Are there any last things that y'all want to add? Any ways that people can follow your work or get into contact with the folks that you support? People can go to antistatestl.noblogs.org. There's a tab on the website that says Ferguson-related prisoners, and that list is up to date as to who's still locked up and who still wants some kind of support. There's also a, a PayPal link for commissary donations or release fund donations. People are also welcome just to directly send it to the folks inside themselves if they prefer that. So the Atlanta jail support effort is not just Atlanta people. A lot of the work is remote. So if you want to help out with our jail support effort, we've got a mountain of work that needs to be done, and we'd be delighted to plug you in and get you trained up to do that. Of course, there's probably a similar effort in your area that you can get involved in with probably a little bit of Googling. If you want to write to any of our long-term prisoners, atljailsupport.org has an email that you can reach out to us on, and we will plug you in and get you connected to one of them. Also, atlblackcross.org is for not specifically protest-related prisoners, but all prisoners who are now protesting the conditions of their confinement or protesting the system in general. And if you visit that site, there are ways to write to them as well. All right. First, I want to pay my respects to the comrades behind bars who are still enduring this repression. Uh, The folks who are facing charges now who might have a journey in front of them still. I want to say we got your back. We support what you're doing. Just stay strong. As far as uh, the work me and my brother are doing, you, you all know that we do a podcast called Twin Trouble. You could check us out at twintrouble.net. As you all might know, I have several conditions of supervised release, which involve stuff about association with civil disobedience and a few of the things that make uh, my involvement and stuff post-release. It's going to be difficult to navigate these conditions. Nevertheless, the spirit of resistance is there. I'm, I'm currently finding ways to become involved in a way that's meaningful and safe for both myself and others. But So yeah, check us out on the podcast, twintrouble.net. We got a few other projects in the works, but I, I just want to show my appreciation to everybody who has had uh, both me and my brothers back uh, up until this point. And uh, the future is unwritten, so who knows what might come next. And now a quick word about supporting the project, as with most episodes. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much to the people that have been contributing regularly via Patreon or via LibrePay or via PayPal. Your ongoing contributions, again, help to support the transcription projects. Uh, Thank you again also to the people that are doing transcription work, as well as those who are formatting zines. Thanks to those who are sending the zines into prisons or who are doing translations. 
All that work is so awesome. We are really proud of the people that we have discussions with on this show and the idea that they're getting into more and more places. Those conversations are being heard or read by people who didn't hear it on the radio or whatever is really edifying. That's a $5 word. Uh, if you want to support us, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash TFSR, where you can find thank you gifts for various levels of pledges. You can also uh, find our merch at thefinalstrawradio.bigcartel.com. And you can make one-time donations via PayPal or Venmo. If you want to get us on a local radio station, check out the tfsr.wtf slash radio page. And there are some clues in there as to why we like being on the radio and how you can help. Uh, And thanks again to all the folks who give us feedback. We do appreciate it. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Bursa Goodness. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at the Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.